Hello, and welcome to the Community IT Innovators Technology Topics Podcast, where we discuss nonprofit technology, cybersecurity, tech project implementation, strategic planning, and nonprofit IT careers. Find us at communityit.com. All right, thank you very much, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, glad you could uh, join us today for this webinar on discovering the value of your nonprofit IT budget. Uh, let me introduce myself first before we get into the webinar. Uh, my name is Johan Hammerstrom, and I'm the CEO at Community IT. I've been with Community IT for over 20 years. I started off as a technician and have experience um, in basically all different, every different asset, facet of uh, providing IT support to nonprofit organizations. Um, I've worked as a technician, as an engineer, I've worked as a consultant, um, as an IT business manager uh, for nonprofit organizations, and I'm now the CEO of Community IT. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, Community IT is a 100% employee-owned managed services provider that works exclusively with nonprofit organizations. Our mission, the reason that we exist, is to help nonprofits accomplish their missions through the effective use of technology. And we have a team of 40 staff, and we work with nonprofits both in the Washington DC area where we are based, as well as nationwide. Um, we've started to work with a number of organizations across the country. Uh, we're a top 501 managed services provider. That's an honor that we receive uh, year after year, and we were um, happy to receive that honor again in uh, 2021. So I'm gonna turn my camera off here so we can focus on uh, the content of today's webinar. So today we're gonna to be talking about uh, budgeting, IT budgeting process, and specifically um, the IT budgeting, uh, an approach to IT budgeting uh, that leads to, to an IT budget. Um, so some of the key takeaways today, uh, we'll be focusing on a specific process that you can follow uh, to create an IT budget. We're gonna talk about how um, through that process, you can connect IT to the organizational goals of the organization. Um, I think oftentimes people, people feel like budgeting uh, is a, you know, about as fun as going to the dentist. It's not something that people get that excited about unless they're coming maybe from a finance background. Um, but we wanna to talk today about how you can actually leverage the budgeting process to your advantage and make it something that uh, really helps you connect IT um, to the goals of the organization. And then as part of that process, uh, we're gonna run through some ways that you can uh, evaluate the existing IT um, as, you, as you go through the budgeting process. So this is the, this is the first thing that I really wanna focus on, um, and that is that budgeting, uh, it's really helpful to think about budgeting not as an end product, not as a set of numbers in a spreadsheet, but rather as a process that you go through. And thinking about budgeting as a process will really will make the whole experience a lot more valuable. So let's start with our first poll today. If you don't mind just uh, responding and letting me know kind of where you are, where is your organization um, in terms of its uh, budgeting process? Do you have a well-defined budget? I mean, so, I'm sorry, a well-defined process? Do you have a process, but it's some one that changes every year? Um, are you an organization that has your budgets kind of always showing up at the last minute? Uh, you know, are your supervisors always asking for, for money? Are you always asking your IT staff for money? I'm sorry, for the budget at the last minute? Um, or do you just not operate out of a budget? Um, that's also a possible option. So we'll just give you a minute here to respond to the poll. Um, Awesome. All right, and so, it looks like, oh, sorry, go no, ahead. Go, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, it's like 47% said yes, a well-defined process. 42% said we have a process, but it changes every year. And 11% said our budgets are always developed at the last minute. Great, great. Well, it seems like almost all of you um, have some sort of process, in some cases, a well-defined process, um, in other cases, a process that changes every year. And obviously, um, depending on your role in the organization, uh, and certainly if you're in IT, you may not have a whole lot of control over uh, the budgeting process. Um, you know, you're, you're sort of 
subject to the process that the organization as a whole is following. Um, but I think some of the things that we, we're going to talk about in the webinar today, you can incorporate into your current process. And I think uh, you'll find that very useful. So the first step in the budgeting process is really preparation. And there are three parts of, of preparing yourself uh, for an IT budgeting process. The first is an assessment. We're going to talk about all of these in more detail. Uh, the second is looking at your previous budget. And the third is evaluating the business plan or the the organizational plan, even the strategic plan in some cases of the organization. So it's really important to look at those three things uh, as you prepare for your budget, and that'll help you to create a draft budget. And I always recommend that organizations put everything they need. If you're, if you're putting together the IT budget um, for your draft budget, put in everything that you need. You know, you're probably not gonna get everything that you ask for, but it's really important to have that documented and to have a record of it um, because it's sort of laying out uh, for you and you know for the rest of the organization um, what's needed from an IT perspective. And then you're going to get into the process of prioritizing. And we'll talk about that in the webinar today as well. And once you prioritize, uh, then you can um, put together a budget plan. And the plan, the budget plan or the IT plan is different from the budget itself. The budget and, and this is the difference. The budget is a written statement of the organizational commitment to specific investments in the coming year. And I like to think of the budget not as a spreadsheet with line items and numbers, but rather it's a written statement of what the organization is committing to in terms of making IT investments in the coming year. And the plan, the budget plan, uh, the IT plan, is the outline of when and how those investments will be made. So I, I love to, to think about the budget and the plan for implementing the budget from this perspective. And that really helps, um, helps me when I work with organizations in putting together um, their budgets for the coming year. So let's talk about the first, the first step in the process, which, which is preparing. And sometimes putting together your IT budget can feel like uh, jumping off a cliff, um, but, you notice this cliff jumper has a parachute and you wanna be prepared um, when you start into that process. So we're gonna talk about some of the ways that you can prepare uh, for going through the IT budgeting process. Uh, before we do, we have another poll for you. And um, this is sort of a, a giveaway as to the first step in that preparation process, and that's conducting an assessment. So I'm curious, uh, over the last 12 months, how many of you have performed an IT assessment? either with a third party, on your own, um, or not having performed one. Awesome, and the answers are coming in. We'll give about 10 more seconds for votes. So if you have not selected an answer, please do so now. Wonderful. And it looks like 29% said, yes, we had a thorough assessment performed by a third party. 43% said we conducted our own informal in-house assessment. And 23 said, no, we have not done one. Great. So it's about a third, just about a third, a third, a third. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about assessments and, and what goes into them. And for those of you who've had an assessment performed by a third party, hopefully this, this lines up with what you had done. Um, for those of you who conducted your own informal in-house assessment, maybe this can provide you with some, some ideas of other things to look at. Uh, and then for those of you who, who haven't done an assessment, um, this might, be, um, might help you to get started in that process. So the um, three things that we, the three sort of areas that we really like to look at when we're doing an assessment, or the three activities, I guess, that, that are involved in the assessments that we do our first an inventory. And we like to inventory the data that the organization's storing, the applications that the organization is using, and the hardware uh, or the infrastructure um, that the organization um, depends upon. So data uh, can be that, depending on the size of the organization and the complexity of its data or information that it's storing, a data inventory can be pretty simple or straightforward 
or it can become much more involved and complex. Um, data includes everything from files and documents that the organization uses to do its work um, to the financial management system, uh, fundraising or donor management systems that the organization might use. Um, it can include uh, program data, so the, the data that the organization uses uh, to accomplish its mission and to, to deliver programs and services. So all of that you want to inventory. You really want to just kind of list it out to make sure you, you know all of the data that the organization is using. And then you can, based on that inventory, start to identify where the, where the information is stored um, and, how, and other things like how it's being backed up and um, who has access to it. So there's a lot of additional tasks that can result from conducting a thorough data inventory that can be very useful for the organization. Oftentimes organizations will find that they have critical data that lives on one person's machine or that it's not being backed up, oftentimes legacy data, um, which sort of just was out of everyone's visibility um, is actually very important to the organization. And that, that might be something that the organization wants to address um, in the coming years. So it's a great um, it's a great piece of information to have when you're thinking about the budget. Um, second, you want to look at applications that the organization is using. Some applications are closely connected to the data. So um, many nonprofits use uh, Razor's Edge, um, Blackboard Razor's Edge for their um, fundraising. And so the fundraising data, the donor data that they have closely connected to that application. In other cases, the application is used for things like communication. Obviously nowadays, a lot of organizations are using Zoom or Teams. Um, in some cases, they might be using Slack. Uh, so there's other applications that sort of promote collaboration and productivity that aren't necessarily storing data. But you wanna understand what all of those applications are. And one of the advantages of going through that process is that in some cases, it helps you to identify, I don't know if people still use this term, but it was really popular about five years ago, this idea of shadow IT, that there are people within the organization, staff members, who are spinning up their own applications to get their work done that may be outside of the purview or visibility of the IT department. Um, this was really common, like I said, four or five years ago with um, solutions like Dropbox, you know, um, nonprofit staff were working on documents. They needed to share them and collaborate with outside uh, consultants or other collaborators and partners. And their in-house file server just didn't allow for that. So they might set up their own um, Dropbox application to share those files. So um, try to be as thorough as you can when you're doing the application inventory, because again, that's a great, you know, data point, knowing that some of the staff are going, you know, on their own to get their own applications um, to get their work done might suggest, you know, software that the organization should invest in or, or budget around implementing um, in order to make the staff more effective. So the, the more thorough uh, your inventory, uh, the better the, the information you'll have as you're working on your budget. And then finally, hardware. This is slightly outdated. I mean, hardware uh, is still very important. Um, staff are still using computers, whether it's laptops or, or desktops. Um, organizations may still have at least one or two servers in their office that are hosting critical information. Um, but oftentimes, you know, a lot of the a lot of that has moved out to the cloud. So some of that could be captured under applications, sort of infrastructure-based applications. Um, like a single sign-on solution, password manager like LastPass, a, um, a uh, identity management solution like Okta, for example, something you're using for multi-factor authentication. So those are all applications that, you know, perform an infrastructure function. And, it, you know, in the old days, three or four years ago, might have thought of those as being more like a, um, you know, more like hardware uh, solution now is really more of a software as a service application. Um, but definitely make sure you, you understand the age of your hardware, um, especially hidden stuff like your network switches and your firewalls. If you still have an office uh, that you either have returned to or are planning to return to at some point, um, make sure you know, you know, what hardware, including printers, all the stuff that sort of falls off the map sometimes 
be sure to inventory all of that as well. Um, and if you're working with a consultant, if you're an IT department yourself, there are definitely some tools out there, scanning tools and inventorying tools uh, that can be useful in, in gathering and automating that process. I will say, you know, I think oftentimes uh, people want to have a fully automated process to gather that inventory. And it's at a certain point, you're just going to have to go around and count stuff. Um, you're going to have to get your staff list and run down the list and make sure you know, okay, how many, which laptop does this person have? You can automate some of that, um, but at, at a certain point, uh, there's no substitute for just seeing things uh, with your own two eyes, so to speak, and, um, you know, inventorying them that way. So inventory, very important, gathering a thorough inventory of data, applications, and hardware and or infrastructure is the and is an important um, first step in the assessment process. The next thing you want to look at is is conduct, the next thing you want to do is conduct a risk analysis. And um, this can become very thorough and, and sophisticated depending on the size of the organization. But I think at its heart, at its core, risk analysis really should focus on cybersecurity and business continuity. And cybersecurity in particular is an area that has become very important over the last two or three years. And most of you are probably familiar with um, the many breaches uh, that are announced in the press on a regular basis. Um, you, may, you may recall the um, pipeline hacking incident earlier this year that um, took down you know, one of the major oil pipelines in the United States and led to a variety of um, you know, uh, gas station shortages. Um, there were long lines at the gas station because this oil pipeline wasn't running. That was all the result of a ransomware attack that attacked that um, pipeline. You may unfortunately have also been the victim yourself of a cybersecurity incident, whether it's uh, fraud, whether it's um, or some kind of uh, virus attack or ransomware attack. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of, uh, as we call them, cyber adversaries out there, including organized crime, which has gotten very involved in, um, in cyber crime because it's so lucrative. And it's becoming something that every organization um, needs to be mindful of. And one of the things that we've seen just in the last year is the increased scrutiny that um, insurance providers are, are taking when it comes to issuing cyber liability policies. Five years ago, cyber liability was just, at, at, it was usually just included on the policy. Sometimes it was just an automatic rider that would be added to the policy. But increasingly, insurance companies are starting to take cyber liability out of their general policy and make it and require um, their customers to get a specific cyber liability policy. And in those cases, we found that the requirements for getting the policy are starting to become much more strict. There used to be sort of a simple checklist. You check a few boxes and you would get your policy. But for the first time in 2020, the, uh, the cost of claims exceeded the revenue from premiums and insurance companies are finding themselves underwater when it comes to cyber liability. And so as a result, they're starting to put much more aggressive um, requirements in their policies. And so now uh, we've started to see um, you know, uh, forms that organizations have to, where they have to attest basically, they have pretty um, aggressive multi-factor authentication in place in order for them to receive a policy or in order for them, you know, in some cases, if they don't, the cost of the policy is, four or five times more expensive. Uh, you know, it could be the difference between a $3,000 policy and a $20,000 policy. So um, if you're coming from the IT side and you don't have exposure, uh, you don't have visibility into your organization's cyber liability insurance, schedule, you know, talk to your finance department, talk to your CFO, whoever's responsible for um, the insurance at your organization. Um, I would talk to them right away, do an, an evaluation, of your organization's um, you know, uh, security posture and risk profile, have a better understanding of the specific threats that your organization faces as you start to put together the budget um, for the coming year, because you want to address those in the budget. So cybersecurity, I can't stress it enough. It's, it's become a major issue uh, for any organization 
Um, so it's, it's, it's very critical. The second thing that's somewhat related to it, but also somewhat independent is um, business continuity. So, and that's basically what happens if there's an interruption to your information services. What happens if a information service is unavailable for whatever reason for a certain period of time? How long can that information be unavailable to the organization? So a common example would be, uh, you know, back in the old days when we were all in offices, um, what if the internet at the office went out? How, what if the power in the building went out? Um, all of the services that are located at the office that depend on power and internet at the office are gonna be unavailable. How long can the organization survive and what's the impact of those services being unavailable? That's essentially business continuity. And this is where the inventory comes in handy because you can map out all of your data and you can say, you know, and, and not all data has equal value to the organization. So uh, depending on the mission and the functions that your organization performs, they may, you can look at the finance data and say, you know what, we can be down for two days. Like we can, we can make do. We, we're not doing, you know, um, time sensitive financial transactions, but if our, um, case management system goes down for more than an hour or two, we're in violation of a grant, you know, and we're going we're gonna to risk losing the funding for that grant. So we have to be able to access our case management information uh, within an hour. Um, we have uh, brand and reputational issues uh, that depend on us having access to uh, member information if you're an association. So there's a lot of different scenarios um, in, in, that you can think about that it would be specific to your organization where the, uh, the data can be down for varying amounts of time. And that's important. So that kind of sort of partners with the data inventory and the application inventory um, because you have to be able to put a, a number on your business continuity uh, solution. So most organizations have at least a basic business continuity solution in the form of backups. They have data backups. Um, if they're storing their information on premise, on a server, they're backing it up somehow. Back in the day, we used to back up to tape. Nowadays, maybe they're backing up to the cloud. Um, how quickly does an organization need to be able to recover data? How quickly do they need to be able to access that data um, in the event of, a, of an outage? So that's really what the, the business continuity plan, um, that's the, that's the strategy or the, the information that it's providing. And then based on that, you can identify whether or not your current business continuity solution is meeting the needs of the organization or needs to be augmented with something more sophisticated. So um, IT really has uh, the responsibility to identify solutions. You know, here are the different various business continuity solutions that might be of value for the organization but it's really the organization's responsibility to identify the business continuity requirements. How, how, um, how long can we be down? How long can we, can we not have access to our information? So that's an important, you may think, well, what does this have to do with budgeting? But that's exactly where the budget comes from. It comes from those, from those requirements. So these are good things to understand as you're going into the budgeting process. And then finally, you wanna evaluate your, your staff's experience, their user experience. Um, how has IT been performing for them? Um, and this is an area where if you're on the IT side, you need to be really focused on user experience. You don't want to be you know, blindsided um, by not knowing how good or how bad or how average or sufficient or insufficient um, IT is for the rest of the organization. So it's really important to understand how well IT is working for everybody. And there are a couple of different ways that you can gather that information. You can just do anecdotal, talk to people, listen to people. Um, IT has an unfortunate reputation of um, not wanting to talk to anybody else in the organization, locking themselves in the server room, you know, holding up in the IT office and and not wanting to talk to anybody and just reaching out to the rest of the organization, asking them how things are going um, is, is, a, is a great way of understanding what the user experience is. And also in general, what I've found 
is that um, most most of the time the, the uh, senior leadership that's involved in approving the budget does care deeply about the IT experience that the staff is having. And so if you can sort of anecdotally say, look, we've we've talked to a bunch of people and they, you know, this solution that we have is just not working for them. It's preventing them from getting their job done. It's creating frustration. It's hurting morale. That's great evidence to take into the budgeting process um, as you think about budget approval. So anecdotal experience, it can be valuable. Obviously, um, surveys uh, provide you with more quantitative and expansive um, results. So a simple IT survey is also something that um, can be very useful. Typically, I guess it varies from organization to organization. Most of the organizations that we work with will do an annual IT survey where they'll you know, cover all of the IT topics at once in one survey. Um, how well is your computer working for you? How's the internet? You know, how, or name frustrations that you have what parts of IT are working really well for you, kind of gathering it all in one shot. We have other clients who they'll just, maybe they have, they already have like a quarterly rhythm for staff surveys and they'll include some IT questions every quarter uh, on different aspects of the IT experience. So there's different ways of doing it, um, but I think surveys are generally, depending on the culture of the organization, a really effective way of understanding user experience. And then finally, ticket analysis is also really vital. Um, you wanna gather all of the tickets that have been generated over the last 12 months and just analyze like who's submitting tickets, who's having the most issues in the organization. Is it a particular set of individuals? Is it a particular department? Um, are they all experiencing similar types of issues? Are 50% are of the tickets related to People getting locked out of their accounts when their password changes are, you know, 50% of the tickets related to email not being accessible. You're, you're not going to get, you're usually not going to get so lucky that you find some, you know, incredible single issue that, you know, you can solve through budgeting. But um, looking at the tickets can definitely reveal patterns and can definitely provide you with more information that can be. Uh, sometimes it supports the anecdotal feedback and sometimes it contradicts the an anecdotal feedback and that can, that has value in and of itself as well. Um, so uh, user experience is a, is a third and very important part of conducting the assessment. So there's other things that assessments can cover, but I think you know at the end of the day, a full scale inventory, an analysis of risks and an understanding of user experience, user experience those are really the fundamentals. You can also look at the previous budget. This is really important um, for, for a variety of reasons, but basically the, the previous budget, um, there, there's probably, if there isn't a previous budget to look at, uh, then it's important to look at IT governance. You know, is the IT governance of the organization effective? And if there's no, if you're going into a situation where there is no IT budget, I would advocate for a specific IT budget. Um, Sometimes IT budgeting is sort of spread out among other departments. That can be very difficult to manage. So in order to manage IT effectively within an organization, uh, as much as possible, you wanna try to have all of the IT elements you know, um, in one place. Uh, so if, if there's no budget or if the budget is dispersed, um, you know, part of the budgeting process for this year would be to advocate for a specific IT budget. And maybe, you know, maybe it's just references. You're, maybe the budget is still officially formally located in another, in another department, but you're at least gathering all that information in one place. So you have, uh, you know, sort of a single pane of glass uh, visibility into it. And if the budget was ignored, you know, maybe, the, maybe, the bud, maybe there was a budget from the previous year, um, but if it was ignored, then that's another good opportunity to review IT governance. Why wasn't the budget followed? Um, as I'd said before, a budget is a written commitment of the organization to specific IT initiatives. Why was that commitment not made, you know, if the budget was ignored? Um, some of the things that are important to look at when you look at the previous year budget, you don't want to just roll the budget over into the new year. Um, you want to look at potential cost increases. 
uh, and these are typically service costs will go up. So your service provider might be increasing their costs. Um, if you have subscriptions, the cost of those subscriptions might be going up. So be sure to, you know, even if you have a great budget from last year and you don't have a lot of things changing in the coming year, you want to keep a close eye on those service costs. And you also want to keep a close eye on staff size changes, particularly if the organization is growing. Um, so that's a, those are two things to look at. And then uh, you also want to, when you're looking at a previous year budget, it's really, really important to identify and evaluate multi-year costs. So this is a real, this is a real gotcha. So um, certain um, cloud-based solutions might have been signed up with a two or three year agreement, and it may not be in last year's budget, but there may be a cloud renewal due uh, in the coming year that wasn't in last year's budget, but was in the budget the year before or the year before that. So um, it's really important to, to look at a couple years budgets if you can, or to try to identify those parts of the budget um, that have multi-year components. DNS, domain name registration is another one. Uh, that typically is a pretty modest cost, um, but uh, you know, if your organization has a lot of domain names, I know a lot of nonprofits might have you know, a dozen, two, three, four dozen domain names uh, that are all renewing at different times and are often on three to five year um, cost cycles. It's important to understand what those are to make sure you're, uh, you've got them in the budget properly for the coming year. Um, and then also hardware uh, warranty renewals is another one. Uh, we've been seeing less and less of this. And I think you know, our recommendation is um, in general, most organizations are really starting to commit to laptops now. And I think that was, that was a, something that really um, became common during the pandemic because you know, staff needed to be more mobile. And, and typically with laptops, you know, you're looking at a three to four year lifespan. So most organizations were buying their computers um, with a uh, three year warranty um, and then just tracking you know, when they needed to replace the hardware based on that. But uh, you know, if it's possible for you to continue using the hardware for another couple of years, then you might need to budget uh, warranty renewals as well. Thank you for joining Community IT for this podcast, part one. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a rating to help others find this leadership resource for nonprofits. Listen for part two in your podcast feed. Community IT does these free webinars and podcasts for our community, and we love sharing our knowledge and experience. If you have more questions or are having trouble with your IT at your nonprofit, please get in touch with us on our website www.communityit.com so we can start a conversation or schedule an assessment. Downloading any of our free resources there will get you signed up for our webinar reminders and you can attend our next webinar in real time and ask our experts your own questions. If you love podcasts, please subscribe and leave us a rating to help others find this leadership resource for nonprofits.